As early as 8,000 BCE, the earliest Neolithic farmers living in the Fertile Crescent began a legacy of cheesemaking, almost as old as civilization itself. The rise of agriculture led to domesticated sheep and goats, which ancient farmers harvested for milk. But when left in warm conditions for several hours, that fresh milk began to sour. Its lactic acids caused proteins to coagulate, binding into soft clumps. Upon discovering this strange transformation, the farmers drained the remaining liquid, later named whey, and found the yellowish globs could be eaten fresh as a soft, spreadable meal. These clumps, or curds, became the building blocks of cheese, which would eventually be aged, pressed, ripened, and whizzed into a diverse cornucopia of dairy delights. The discovery of cheese gave Neolithic people an enormous survival advantage. Milk was rich with essential proteins, fats, and minerals, but it also contained high quantities of lactose, a sugar which is difficult to process for many ancient and modern stomachs. Cheese, however, could provide all of milk's advantages with much less lactose, and since it could be preserved and stockpiled, these essential nutrients could be eaten throughout scarce famines and long winters. The elephant boasts the largest brain of any land mammal, as well as an impressive encephalization quotient. This is the size of the brain relative to what we'd expect for an animal's body size, and the elephant's EQ is nearly as high as a chimpanzee's. And despite the distant relation, convergent evolution has made it remarkably similar to the human brain, with as many neurons and synapses in a highly developed hippocampus and cerebral cortex. It is the hippocampus strongly associated with emotion that aids recollection by encoding important experiences into long-term memories. The ability to distinguish this importance makes elephant memory a complex and adaptable faculty beyond rote memorization. It's what allows elephants who survived a drought in their youth to recognize its warning signs in adulthood, which is why clans with older matriarchs have higher survival rates. Unfortunately, it's also what makes elephants one of the few non-human animals to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. The cerebral cortex, on the other hand, enables problem solving, which elephants display in many creative ways. They also tackle problems cooperatively, sometimes even outwitting the researchers and manipulating their partners. And they've grasped basic arithmetic, keeping track of the relative amounts of fruit in two baskets after multiple changes. Many patients acquire the allergy label as children when a rash appears after they're treated for an infection with penicillin or closely related drugs. The rash is often blamed on penicillin, while the more likely culprit is the original infection or a reaction between the infection and the antibiotic. However, genuine penicillin allergies, where our immune systems mistake penicillin for an attacker, do occur rarely and can be very dangerous. So if you think you're allergic, but don't know for sure, your best bet is to visit an allergist. They'll complete an evaluation that'll confirm whether or not you have the allergy. Even if you do have a penicillin allergy, your immune cells that react to the drug may lose their ability to recognize it. In fact, about 80% of people who are allergic to penicillin outgrow their allergy within 10 years. This is great news for people who currently identify as allergic to penicillin, the drug may one day save their lives, as it has done for so many others. Although modern money laundering methods vary greatly, most share three basic steps. Placement, 
layering and integration. Placement is where illegally obtained money is converted into assets that seem legitimate. That's often done by depositing funds into a bank account registered to an anonymous corporation or a professional middleman. This step is where criminals are often most vulnerable to detection since they introduce massive wealth into the financial system seemingly out of nowhere. The second step, layering, involves using multiple transactions to further distance the funds from their origin. This can take the form of transfers between multiple accounts or the purchase of tradable property like expensive cars, artwork and real estate. Casinos, where large sums of money change hands every second, are also popular venues for layering. A money launderer may have their gambling balance made available at a casino chain's locations in other countries or work with employees to rig games. The last step, integration, allows clean money to re-enter the mainstream economy and to benefit the original criminal. They might invest it into a legal business, claim payment by producing fake invoices, or even start a bogus charity, placing themselves on the board of directors with an exorbitant salary. Nobody knows exactly when humans began to create fermented beverages. The earliest known evidence comes from 7000 BCE in China, where residue in clay pots has revealed that people were making an alcoholic beverage from fermented rice, millet, grapes, and honey. Within a few thousand years, cultures all over the world were fermenting their own drinks. Ancient Mesopotamians and Egyptians made beer throughout the year from stored cereal grains. This beer was available to all social classes, and workers even received it in their daily rations. They also made wine, but because the climate wasn't ideal for growing grapes, it was a rare and expensive delicacy. By contrast, in Greece and Rome, where grapes grew more easily, wine was as readily available as beer was in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Because yeasts will ferment basically any plant sugars, ancient peoples made alcohol from whatever crops and plants grew where they lived. In South America, people made chicha from grains, sometimes adding hallucinogenic herbs. In what's now Mexico, pulque, made from cactus sap, was the drink of choice, while East Africans made banana and palm beer. And in the area that's now Japan, people made sake from rice. Drug interactions happen when a combination of a drug with another substance causes different effects than either would individually. Foods, herbal supplements, legal drugs, and illicit substances can all cause drug interactions. Most drug interactions fall into two categories. Some take place when two substances' effects influence each other directly. In other cases, one substance affects how the body processes another, like how it is absorbed, metabolized, or transported around the body. Blood thinners and aspirin, for example, have similar effects that become dangerous when combined. Both prevent blood clots from forming. Blood thinners by preventing the formation of the clotting factors that hold clots together, and aspirin by preventing blood cells from clumping into groups that become clots. Individually, these effects are usually safe, but taken together, they can prevent blood clotting to a dangerous extent, possibly causing internal bleeding. While blood thinners and aspirin are generally harmless when taken individually, interactions where one substance exacerbates the effects of another can also take place between drugs that are independently harmful.
Nearly 9,000 years ago, corn, also called maize, was first domesticated from teosinte, a grass native to Mesoamerica. Teosinte's rock-hard seeds were barely edible, but its fibrous husk could be turned into a versatile material. Over the next 4,700 years, farmers bred the plant into a staple crop with larger cobs and edible kernels. As maize spread throughout the Americas, it took on an important role, with multiple indigenous societies revering a corn mother as the goddess who created agriculture. When Europeans first arrived in America, they shunned the strange plant. Many even believed it was the source of physical and cultural differences between them and the Mesoamericans. However, their attempts to cultivate European crops in American soil quickly failed, and the settlers were forced to expand their diet. Finding the crop to their taste, maize soon crossed the Atlantic, where its ability to grow in diverse climates made it a popular grain in many European countries. But the newly established United States was still the corn capital of the world. We may think of nature as being unconnected to our urban spaces, but trees have always been an essential part of successful cities. Trees act like a natural sponge, absorbing stormwater runoff before releasing it back into the atmosphere. The webs of their roots protect against mudslides, while allowing soil to retain water and filter out toxins. Roots help prevent floods, while reducing the need for storm drains and water treatment plants. Their porous leaves purify the air by trapping carbon and other pollutants, making them essential in the fight against climate change. Humanity has been uncovering these arboreal benefits for centuries, but trees aren't just crucial to the health of a city's infrastructure. They play a vital role in the health of its citizens as well. In the 1870s, Manhattan had few trees outside the island's parks. Without trees to provide shade, buildings absorbed up to nine times more solar radiation during deadly summer heat waves. Combined with the period's poor sanitation standards, the oppressive heat made the city a breeding ground for bacteria like cholera. If you have an old phone, you may want to consider your options before throwing it away. To minimize waste, you could donate it to a charity for reuse, take it to an e-waste recycling facility, or look for a company that refurbishes old models. However, even recycling companies need our scrutiny. Just as the production of smartphones comes with social and environmental problems, dismantling them does too. E-waste is sometimes intentionally exported to countries where labor is cheap but working conditions are poor. Vast workforces, often made up of women and children, may be underpaid, lack the training to safely disassemble phones, and be exposed to elements like lead and mercury, which can permanently damage their nervous systems. Phone waste can also end up in huge dump sites, leaching toxic chemicals into the soil and water, mirroring the problems of the mines where the elements originated. A phone is much more than it appears to be on the surface. It's an assemblage of elements from multiple countries, linked to impacts that are unfolding on a global scale. So until someone invents a completely sustainable smartphone, We'll need to come to terms with how this technology affects widespread places and people. Our memories are sometimes unreliable. And though we still don't know precisely what causes this fallibility on a neurological level, research has highlighted some of the most common ways our memories diverge from what actually happened. The MALL study highlights how we can incorporate information from outside sources, 
like other people or the news into our personal recollections without realizing it. This kind of suggestibility is just one influence on our memories. Take another study in which researchers briefly showed a random collection of photographs to a group of participants, including images of a university campus none of them had ever visited. When shown the images three weeks later, a majority of participants said that they had probably or definitely visited the campus in the past. The participants misattributed information from one context, an image they'd seen, onto another, a memory of something they believed they actually experienced. In another experiment, people were shown an image of a magnifying glass and then told to imagine a lollipop. They frequently recalled that they saw the magnifying glass and the lollipop. They struggled to link the objects to the correct context, whether they actually saw them or simply imagined them. The group of artists who are considered abstract expressionists includes Barnett Newman with his existential zips, William de Kooning, famous for his travestied women, Helen Frankenthaler, who created soak stains, and others. But perhaps the most famous, influential, and head-scratching one was Jackson Pollock. Most of his paintings are immediately recognizable. They feature tangled messes of lines of paint bouncing around in every direction on the canvas. And sure, these fields of chaos are big and impressive, but what's so great about them? Didn't he just drip the paint at random? Can't anyone do that? Well, the answer to these questions is both yes and no. While Pollock implemented a technique anyone is technically capable of, regardless of artistic training, only he could have made his paintings. This paradox relates to his work's roots in the surrealist automatic drawings of André Masson and others. These surrealists supposedly drew directly from the unconscious to reveal truths hidden within their minds. Occasionally, instead of picturing something and then drawing it, they let their hands move automatically and would later tease out familiar figures that appeared in the scribbles. One evidence-based way to better remember what you've learned is through spaced repetition, or spacing out your learning and practice of new knowledge or skills. Although this might seem novel, this is hardly a new concept. It was first described in 1885 by a German psychologist named Hermann Ebbinghaus. Here's how it works. Say you plot your attention, or how much you remember of something, versus time. Now you learn that something on day zero. Without reviewing it, the forgetting curve will look like an exponentially decaying curve, which is kind of scary. If you review, or better yet, actively retrieve the material at increasingly spaced intervals after learning it, then the forgetting curve starts to flatten out, and you'll get a lot better long-term retention. Now, the goal here is to review the material at the right time. It turns out that the best time to revisit information that you're trying to learn is right around the time that you would naturally forget it. Since forgetting typically follows this exponential curve, the trick becomes timing your study sessions around it. Practically, this means having more widely spaced intervals between study times for the material that you're more familiar with, and shorter intervals between study sessions for material that you're less familiar with. Montessori education is based on the principles developed by Maria Montessori, who opened her first school for children of low-income workers in an apartment building in Rome in 1907. The school was called Casa dei Bambini, Home for Children. This first casa was furnished with a teacher's table, a stove, a blackboard, some chairs, group tables for the children, 
and a cabinet filled with materials that Montessori developed in her earlier career when she researched how to teach kids who experience some form of mental disability. Maria Montessori created the materials after she realized that students seemed to understand complex concepts better when they engaged all their senses. Activities at this first school included personal care, such as dressing and undressing, care of the environment, like sweeping, dusting, and gardening. Otherwise, they were free to move around and play with the materials. Montessori did not teach herself, but instead oversaw the classroom work of her teachers. Montessori observed that children showed episodes of deep concentration and multiple repetitions of the same activity. Given free choice, kids showed more interest in practical activities and the materials than normal toys, sweets, or other rewards. Over time, spontaneous self-discipline emerged. Montessori concluded that working independently, children seemed to reach new levels of autonomy and became self-motivated learners. She began to see the role of the teacher as a facilitator of young human beings who are free to move and act within the limits of a prepared environment. The goal? To grow children to become independent and responsible adults who share a love for learning. English philosopher John Locke gives us a pretty standard way to map out the boundaries of intuition, so that's where we'll start. Locke contrasts intuition to sensory perception on one side and to demonstration on the other. Sensory perception, he notices, is always about particular things. You see this pizza in front of you right now. Maybe you see that this pizza is round. But we aren't restricted to making judgments about particular things. When we judge that no round things are square, we aren't just thinking about that particular pizza, but about a more general and abstract truth. Judging that circles are different from squares, according to Locke, is intuitive. And at least in this kind of case, where Locke thinks we're recognizing features of our ideas, intuition is a perfectly good source of knowledge. We know that no round things are square through intuition. Locke also draws a contrast between intuition and demonstration. Intuition can tell us directly that a circle is not a triangle. But when we get to more complex questions, we need to use demonstration or explicit reasoning. So for example, we can figure out that the interior angles of a triangle add up to two right angles. But we have to go through a series of steps to gain this knowledge, and that's demonstration. Demonstration requires conscious stages. Intuition is immediate. Locke notices that intuition and demonstration are connected, however. Each individual step in a chain of demonstrative reasoning is, or at least should be, intuitive. Contemporary thinkers still draw a similar distinction, using a variety of labels for it. During a time when the church controlled what people could believe and the kings ruled over what people ought to own, John Locke, an English doctor, popularized three ideas that changed society and parenting forever. First, people keep fighting over their beliefs because nobody can actually know which one is true. To solve this problem, everyone should have freedom of thought and the right to choose their own religion. Second, kings can't just do as they please because people have natural rights to liberty, property and life and hence need to be asked for permission. Third, parents should avoid punishing their children since the use of emotions to make them behave well can make them sensationalist. Instead, they should allow their children to be guided by thoughts. 
Locke's ideas on religion and democracy became the foundation of most liberal societies. His thoughts on education, however, may have been even more influential. Locke understood that most people doubt new ideas without any other apparent reason than them being uncommon. However, teaching children how to think rationally and all for themselves works. Education is therefore the key to freeing society from political and psychological tyranny, and his book, Some Thoughts Concerning Education, became a parenting guide to that world. So the idea is that you experience awe in situations where it's important to be acquiring information that you can use later. It makes sense. If something is awe-inspiring because it doesn't fit with your understanding of the world, that's probably something that you should know more about if you want to survive. The feeling of awe directs your attention away from yourself and toward your environment so you can acquire more information about this new, possibly life-changing thing, whether it's positive or negative. So awe might have given us a social advantage or an intellectual advantage, or maybe some combination of both. But no matter why the emotion evolved, we know that it's incredibly powerful to the point that it can like totally hack your brain and body. For one thing, it can improve your physical health. It's been linked to lower levels of inflammation, which plays a role in all sorts of illnesses. Awe can also change your perception of what's causing events to unfold. Studies have found that it makes people more likely to interpret a series of events as the consequence of something intentional as opposed to random chance. It's all part of the search for an explanation for something your brain is struggling to comprehend, which could help us explain why religion is a thing. Fundamentally, the blackmailer is entitled. They believe that others are responsible for their feelings. They believe others must act in a way that makes them feel good, rather than taking responsibility for their own feelings. Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. What about the person who lets themselves be blackmailed? Why do they allow that? The blackmailer refuses to take responsibility for their own feelings. But the blackmailee is the exact opposite. They take responsibility for feelings that aren't their own. While the blackmailer wants everyone around them to act a certain way, the blackmailee wants everyone to feel a certain way. While the blackmailer feels entitled, the blackmailee feels like they owe a debt. While the blackmailer passes judgments, the blackmailee is always looking to be positively judged. They take the judgments of other people very seriously. If someone says to them, you're a very selfish person, they believe it immediately. They think, Am I selfish? I must be selfish. Why would someone say that if I wasn't? Oh God, I'm such a bad person. I need to fix this right now. While the blackmailer wants everyone to serve them, the blackmailee wants to serve everyone. They want to be liked and approved by everyone, and they'll do just about anything to get it. While the blackmailer believes what they say is the truth, the blackmailee believes that what others say about them is the truth. And while the blackmailer's mind is dominated by taking, the Black Mei Li's mind is dominated by giving. When we fall in love, we tend to fall in love with somebody who wouldn't normally be considered compatible with us, because their personality traits are opposite to ours. This allows us to fit together like pieces of a puzzle. This person's good traits compensate for our bad ones and vice versa. When we look back on it, we often wonder how we could have fallen in love with somebody who was so different from ourselves. But nature intended for us to fall in love, and it made sure we would be having our brains release what we call feel-good hormones, including oxytocin, phenylethylamine, serotonin, and dopamine. These hormones give aid to a bio biochemical process that rids us of stressors and fills us with infatuation. That is why it's so hard for us to recognize our partner's flaws. 
These hormones hide our flaws and encourage us to do whatever we can to keep the romance alive. While we aren't actually lying to our partners, we're wearing a mask of adoration. Taking off this mask and revealing who we really are may influence our partner to leave, so we keep it on. Knowing this, in order to avoid any major confrontations and confusion with your partner, you can work on bringing up somewhat difficult topics with them, such as whether or not you both want children or wish to be married. A massive forest provides a whole lot of fuel. So unless we want our national parks to become heaps of ash, there are some blazes that we need to shut down as quickly as they start. Dumping crazy amounts of water on a forest fire is one pretty effective approach. Water does a couple big things. First, water interferes with that combustion reaction because as it vaporizes, it creates a layer of water vapor that separates the fire's fuel from the atmospheric oxygen that it needs to keep going. Second, the water cools the fuel, which slows and ultimately extinguishes the reaction. During a forest fire, firefighters work quickly to put out anything ablaze, including embers, which can fly around and spread the fire. They spray water from the ground and sky, refilling tanks at nearby water sources like lakes, rivers, or even your family's pool. At the same time, crews are creating a fire break, which is exactly what it sounds like, a break between the fire and its fuel. But dumping water and cutting down forest often isn't enough. So here's where that bright red stuff comes in. It's a long-term fire retardant, which means it can be sprayed on an area and unless it gets washed away by a rainstorm, it'll stick around for months. It's made of 85% water, 10% fertilizer, and 5% other stuff like clay and gum thickeners that help keep it together so that it makes it to the ground from the plane. We all get afraid and feel fear. Seeing a spider, a loud noise, or a creak on the floorboard late at night can strike fear suddenly throughout our bodies. The feeling of fear can make your heart race, breath quicken, scream, sweat, pupils dilate, freeze you in place, and can even cause involuntary urination. These are all stress reactions caused by our limbic system, a chain reaction in areas of the brain that work together to control a built-in flight or fight or flight response. We have this built into us to help us react to and survive threats. If not for fear, we would most likely not survive as a species. Lots of people actually seek out fear, enjoying being and feeling scared, watching horror films, playing scary games, or even going on a roller coaster. When our flight or fight response is triggered, we release chemicals which are similar to that of when we are excited or happy. When we trigger this, this is what we perceive as a safe environment. It is thought we can then enjoy being scared and the chemicals running around our body that are akin to high arousal states. One, one of the most surprising insights from Einstein is that time is not what we intuitively think it is, right? Most of us have this sense that time for you is the same as time for me. And sometimes there is a cosmic clock that out there taking second after second after second. Dragging it's all in exactly the same way into the future. Einstein found that if you and I are moving relative to each other, however, our clocks don't take off the time at the same rate. Our watches, if they were once in sync, if we're moving relative to each other. They fall out synchronization. And what does that mean? All that means that what I consider to be happening right now, at a given moment, from your perspective, that might be the past or might be the future? What you consider to be happening right now to me, that may be the past or the future? Now since your view of reality is every bit as valid as my view of reality, that means you cannot really say the past is gone, because that might be your now, your reality. You cannot really say that the future is yet to be, maybe the future to me might be your now. Your reality at that given moment, so in a sense past, present and future are all equally really, all exist, all out there.
There was a time when the subject of happiness was the business of philosophers, as part of their discussion of what makes for the good life. Then, much later, psychologists and sociologists got in on the act, and now, it seems, so has the government. I understand that governments should have the welfare and well-being of those it governs at heart from the purely practical point of view of keeping people quiet, at home enjoying their gadgets and comfort, rather than on the streets rioting. But surely it's not something you can legislate for. Today, there are numerous journals on the topic and it is even included in the curriculum at some universities and colleges. Surveys are done, statistics compiled, graphs drawn, yet all they seem to prove is what most people have conduced themselves from personal experience. An obvious example would be that having a lot of money doesn't necessarily make you happy. We all wish to be happy and have ideas about what it is we think would make us so. But we also know or suspect that it's not that easy. Most of us learn that it is a byproduct of something else. Usually being totally absorbed or involved in some task or pastime and can only be reached that way. These activities, of course, must be worthwhile in themselves. Today, I want to look at some research that has been done into what motivates people and particularly, on what is called the mindset or more simply, the mental attitude that highly motivated people have. And, of course, the attitude of those who aren't so motivated. Or who lose their motivation. Now, it's obvious that motivation is crucial to performance, but that doesn't tell us where it comes from. Why is it that some people work hard and do well, while others can work just as hard and don't? Why some are committed to what they are doing and others aren't? Finding answers to this question would be extremely useful to educators, as well as in other areas of life. Businesses, for example, have long believed that financial incentives, bonuses, perks, pay rises are the great motivators, and to an extent they can make a difference but what we are calling the mindset is more important. What has made it difficult to find out what the causes of motivation are? Is that motivation and the capacity for hard work can be mistaken for talent thinking it's a gift? Either you've got it or you haven't. People who believe this have a fixed mindset and are not only going to perform less well than they could, but it's also an attitude that will affect their whole outlook on life. Some say that if talent is something people are born with and you're unlucky enough not to have any, then there's not much point putting in all that extra effort for no real reward. However, research has shown that if you put in the hours, practice brings the same level of achievement as talent. It's a question of changing this fixed attitude and adopting a growth attitude, which includes seeing mistakes and failures as opportunities to improve. It is almost impossible these days not to include photography in a course on the history of art. I disagree with people such as Walter Benjamin who suggest that technology and art don't go well together. Photography, with its realism, its accurate representation of the thing in front of you, initially deprived many artists of their subject matter, forcing them to look in new ways, no bad thing. True, mass-produced images of, say, the Mona Lisa, obviously can't provide the same experience as seeing the real painting. On the other hand, there are photographs which, to my mind, are far more thought-provoking and have greater emotional impact than a painting of the same subject could. Some people say that the traditional idea of an artist with a trained hand and eye is old-fashioned. They no longer believe that an artist needs specialist knowledge but rather that he or she can simply point a camera at a scene and record it. However, on the one hand, that ignores the creative skill involved in producing photographs. On the other hand, it also ignores the fact that even in the past, painters used various technological aids. For example, the Dutch painter, 
Vermeer, used a camera obscura to help him create his images. We'll go into that later, but for now, I want to look at the documentary and cultural value of photography. Now, you might think it's strange that in a lecture on biology, I will be talking a lot about mathematics, um, if I may digress a bit. When I was a student, mathematics, the language of dear abstraction, had nothing to do with life sciences, like biology. The sphere of messy organic forms, cutting up frogs in the lab, and so on, um, in fact, I started doing biology precisely to avoid maths and physics. So, I've had a lot of catching up to do. We are all aware of how the sciences have come to interrelate more and more. And not only will mathematics impinge more and more on biology, but also, I am told, in the 21st century, the driving force behind mathematics will be biology. This is partly because mathematicians are always on the lookout for more areas to conquer. But a far greater reason is that the subject has been boiled down to physics and chemistry obvious attractions for mathematicians. A number of mathematical fields can be applied to biology. For example, knot theory is used in the analysis of the tangled strands of DNA. And abstract geometry in four or more dimensions is used to tell us about viruses. Again, neuroscience appears to be mass-friendly, and equations can also explain why hallucinogenic drugs cause the users to see spirals. So, if mathematicians are taking such a keen interest in biology, the least we can do, as biologists, is return the compliment. Now, you might think it's strange that in a lecture on biology, I will be talking a lot about mathematics, um, if I may digress a bit. When I was a student, mathematics, the language of dear abstraction, had nothing to do with life sciences like biology. The sphere of messy organic forms, cutting up frogs in the lab, and so on, um, in fact, I started doing biology precisely to avoid maths and physics. So, I've had a lot of catching up to do. We are all aware of how the sciences have come to interrelate more and more. And not only will mathematics impinge more and more on biology, but also, I am told, in the 21st century, the driving force behind mathematics will be biology. This is partly because mathematicians are always on the lookout for more areas to conquer. But a far greater reason is that the subject has been boiled down to physics and chemistry obvious attractions for mathematicians. A number of mathematical fields can be applied to biology. For example, knot theory is used in the analysis of the tangled strands of DNA. And abstract geometry in four or more dimensions is used to tell us about viruses. Again, neuroscience appears to be mass-friendly, and equations can also explain why hallucinogenic drugs cause the users to see spirals. So, if mathematicians are taking such a keen interest in biology, the least we can do, as biologists, is return the compliment. Now as urban planners, what we really need to start considering is the amount of space allocated for residential areas within a city or town. And when I say space, I'm talking about space within a dwelling or home rather than the actual size of residential areas. There's growing concern that the internal space of new homes is becoming far smaller. Too small, in fact. Maybe you're thinking, is it important for residents to have sufficient space? Is it merely a preference to have more space or are there more serious implications? Is there, in fact, any evidence to suggest cramped living conditions affect residents' physical or mental well-being or their day-to-day -day life? 
Well, research from a number of sources indicates that this is an important issue which needs addressing. Cramped conditions can lead to aggressive behavior, to family tensions, psychological anguish and, in the more extreme cases, physical illness as well. Not only this, but there is a proven link between overcrowding and the social and emotional development of children as well as their educational attainment. So, the main issue here is that residents require enough individual space to be able to live and function together, but with sufficient private space for personal time within the home. Now as we all know, it has long been the habit in many countries that teachers give homework to school children of all ages. Despite the fact that a minority of educators don't agree with this practice, it has never seriously been questioned or challenged before. However, it may be that the tide is turning. These days, more people are becoming convinced that homework is of virtually no benefit, particularly for children in the younger age group. So, why have teachers always given homework? Well, the answer seems to be because they are obliged to. Most teachers don't really believe it has any real value. And the latest research supports the teachers' feelings about this. Not only does homework have very little impact on children's learning, but it also puts unnecessary obligations and responsibilities onto the parents. These days, not all families have the time or the necessary knowledge to help their offspring. So it would seem that now, senior educators want to start a new initiative. Rather than giving homework, they plan to encourage reading books of any kind, just reading. And they claim that this is a far more effective method of consolidating learning than wading through piles of written homework. What I want to look at today is the question of how much technology, if, um, a pen can indeed be called technology, perhaps I should say the instrument of writing affects a writer's style and level of production. I also want to consider other factors that may have an effect on prose style, such as personality, educational background, and so on. Now, production levels aren't so hard to measure in relation to the writing instrument used. The quill pen, for instance, would need continual refilling and resharpening, which led to a leisurely, balanced style of prose full of simple sentences. Writing took a lot longer than now, and the great novelists of the 18th century, Fielding, Smollett, Richardson, had a relatively small output, though some of their books ran to enormous length. By the middle of the 19th century, the fountain pen had been invented. It didn't need such constant refilling which can account for the more flowing, discursive style of, say, Dickens and Thackeray, as well as their tremendous output. Then came the typewriter, whose purpose, once you got the hang of it, was to speed up the writing process and was therefore much favored by journalists. This, it seems to me, gave rise to a short-winded style, characterized by short sentences. A short prose style, if you like. Dictating machines and tape recorders led, as one novelist complained, to writers becoming too conversational, rambling, and long-winded. Henry James, although he didn't use these machines, dictated his later novels, and, well, some might agree with this accusation. Well, it looks as though we're going to have to leave word processors, computers, and, of course, the way film and its narrative techniques have affected writing style for another day. The internet is changing everything. The world of language in the future is totally different from the world of language in the past, and the reason is quite simple. There is more written language on the internet now than all the libraries in the world combined. We've never seen anything like it before, 
and we haven't seen anything yet. When you're talking about the future of a language, we are asking about its long-term prospects, where do they essentially lie? And my answer is they lie in the young people. They lie especially in the hands of teenagers. The teenagers are the parents of the next generation of children. If teenagers are going to succeed in maintaining the intergenerational transmission of a language, then they have got to be infused about the minority language. The endangered language that their parents and others speak, so how would you get teenagers infused is the question. Well, there is no question today, the only thing that infuses teenagers, apart from sex, is the internet and all the electronic world. And so, that is the area where one has got to focus. A minority language has got to get itself up electronically in all the varieties that are available to it. Now, in the case of something like Welsh, there is already quite a strong Welsh presence on the World Wide Web. And increasingly there are Welsh chat rooms, Welsh blogs, Welsh Facebook interactions, and soon. Well, this is a very, very positive sign, and it needs to be reinforced as much as possible. The future of the Welsh language, I think all languages actually lie in the electronic domain. We actually have seen more than one of these black holes emerge, and we've seen actually two about equally good, although the one that we talked about you can see with your eyes. The second one is the one with the lighter black holes in it, they're not so heavy. When the ringing is a lot longer and you can see it without all the fancy data analysis. Then there is a third source which we've already published, but now that we have seen that two of the other one and we also believe that could very well be black hole theory so we have three sources. Let's call it three sources in three months. Now if we make design sensitivity, we have improved apparatus by another factor of three. Now how does that translate into rate? It turns out if you look with a sensitivity three times better than we have. You can look three times deeper into the universe. That says the volume of the universe that you are looking at is 3 to the q, so that's about 27 or 30 around the universe. So instead of seeing one a month of these black hole periods, we should see one of maybe one of every two days. One every day. That's gonna change the character of how we operate completely. At that moment launched into what I called the astronomy, that's associated gravitational wave astronomy. That's gonna be a big day. Okay, to help you with your research, I just wanted to give you some tips today on using focus groups. These are groups of people that you get together to find out about their opinions and attitudes, for example, to review a piece of work or just basically provide some collective input to help you with whatever you're researching. First of all, how large should a focus group be? Well, I would say that an ideal number of participants is around six or seven. If it's any bigger. What quite often happens is they break into side conversations and the focus is lost. If it's any smaller, you may not get the range of views that you need to get a really good discussion. Secondly, it's important that you have a moderator for the group who's able to facilitate and guide the discussions. The moderator must ensure that everyone participates and stop anyone dominating. And also, the moderator needs to make sure that the discussions don't go off in the wrong direction. And thirdly, in order to help the group focus on what's required, some basic materials should be used particularly to kickstart the discussions. This may be in the form of pictures, photos, diagrams, graphs, etc. And will help the group to understand the context of what needs to be discussed.
Across the world, people have been watching the choice that Britain has made. I would reassure those markets and investors that Britain's economy is fundamentally strong. And I would also reassure Britons living in European countries and European citizens living here that there will be no immediate changes in your circumstances. There will be no initial change in the way your people can travel, in the way your goods can move, or the way your services can be sold. We must now prepare for a negotiation with the European Union. This will need to involve the full engagement of the Scottish, Welsh, and Northern Ireland governments to ensure that the interests of all parts of our United Kingdom are protected and advanced. But above all, this will require strong, determined, and committed leadership. I'm very proud and honored to have been Prime Minister of this country for six years. I believe we've made great steps, with more people in work than ever before in our history, with reforms to welfare and education, increasing people's life chances, building a bigger and stronger society, keeping our promises to the poorest people in the world, and enabling those who love each other to get married, whatever their sexuality. But above all, restoring Britain's economic strength. One other key to Apple is Apple's incredibly collaborative company, and so you know how many committees we have in Apple? Zero. No committee. We are organized like a startup. One person's in charge of iPhone OS software, one person is in charge of Mac hardware. One person is in charge of iPhone hardware engineering, another person is in charge of worldwide marketing, another person's in charge of operations. We're organized like a startup. We're the biggest startup on the planet and we all meet for three hours once a week and we talk about everything we're doing, the whole business, and there's tremendous teamwork at the top of the company which filters down to tremendous teamwork throughout the company. And teamwork is dependent on trusting the other folks to come through with their part without watching them all the time, but trusting that they're gonna come through with their parts and that's what we do really well. And we're great at figuring out how to divide things up in these great teams that we have and all work on the same thing, touch base frequently and bring it all together into a product. We do that really well and so what I do all day is meet with teams of people and work on ideas and solve problems to make new products, to make new marketing programs, whatever it is. There are four fundamental forces at work in the universe. Some of them are very familiar from everyday life, some of them are not, so we all know about gravity, that's one of the four forces, it's what keeps us anchored to the surface of the earth, keeps the earth in orbit around the sun. There is another force that we're very familiar with, which is the electromagnetic force, that is the force that is responsible for the electricity, electric currents for light, for the sun's light that's electromagnetic radiation coming from the sun to the earth. There are two other forces though, that are somewhat less familiar, they are the nuclear forces. They are forces that are at work within the nuclear atoms. One of those forces is called the strong nuclear force, that really is the force that bides protons to protons. Bides the quarks inside of the protons and neutrons, keeping them from flying out. The other nuclear force is called the weak nuclear force. And that's a force that predominantly we know of because it's responsible for radioactivity, radioactive decay. So those four forces. Strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force, electromagnetic force, and gravitational force, those are the forces that work in the universe. A dimension of space is basically an independent direction in which, in principle, you could move or walk. We talk about left and right, back and forth, and up and down as examples of independent directions in space. 
however. A diagonal direction is not a new direction because it's just a combination of moving this way and that way. When we talk about dimensions, we refer to the independent directions in space which we can move. Another way to think about dimensions is as data that needs to be specified in order to delineate where something takes place. For example, if you are having a dinner party, you need to give your friend three pieces of information to nail down a location in three dimensions of space, a straight across direction in the floor. According to the string theory, in reality, you need to give your friend more than just those three pieces of information if you really want him or her to know where to go. You need to tell them coordinates, data that specifies the real actual dimensions of the dinner party's location. However, because the actual dimensions we think about are so small, it does not matter to your friend whether they show up exactly at the right location and actual dimensions or not, because things are not able to penetrate them in any meaningful way. But that's what a dimension would be, a piece of data necessary to delineate where something takes place. So, continuing our series of lectures on modernism, we now turn to architecture and, in particular, to the work of Frank O. Gehry. Now, I'm not going to go into his career in detail, it is enough to say that early on he was, like other modernist architects, tied to the rectangle, the straight line, and so on. Often, their buildings would have this basic shape, and they would just turn, add bits of decoration like splashes of color or pointless balconies. Soon enough, Gary wanted to break away from straight lines and grid-like designs. He wanted the freedom to experiment with other shapes, curves, and unusually angled roofs. What helped him with this was the computer, which allowed him to visualize and experiment with complex shapes and to work on the whole design as one piece, without the added decoration being thrown in as an afterthought. Architecture is art, if you like, or, or sculpture even. He himself said that he had struggled with crossing the line between architecture and sculpture. Now, I want to talk about one building in particular, um, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which I think you'll agree is a masterpiece. This week, I'd like to start by talking a bit about electric vehicles. Although we tend to think of electric cars as being something completely modern, they were in fact some of the earliest types of motorized vehicle. At the beginning of the 20th century, electric cars were actually more popular than cars with an internal combustion engine as they were more comfortable to ride in. However, as cars fueled by petrol increased in importance, electric cars declined. The situation became such that electric vehicles were only used for certain specific purposes as forklift trucks, ambulances, and urban delivery vehicles, for example. Although electricity declined in use in road vehicles, it steadily grew in importance as a means of powering trains. Switzerland, for example, was quick to develop an electrified train system, encouraged in this no doubt by the fact that it had no coal or oil resources of its own. Nowadays, there is renewed interest in electricity as a means of powering road vehicles. Why is this the case? Well, undoubtedly economic reasons are of considerable importance. The cost of oil has risen so sharply that there is a strong financial imperative to look for an alternative. However, there are also environmental motivations. Emissions from cars are blamed in large part for, among other things, the destruction of the ozone layer and the resultant rise in temperatures in the polar regions. A desire not to let things get any worse is also encouraging research into designing effective electric transport.
Interviewer, in an article that you wrote that I just read, you said you wished you could take everyone back to decades ago to look at the Florida Keys. Interviewee, 50 years ago. Think about how much change has taken place in that short period of time. We have managed to consume on the order of 90% of the big fish in the ocean, the tunas, the swordfish, the sharks. They're mostly gone. Until recently, people have had the belief that there isn't much we puny human beings can do to change the nature of the ocean. But in fact, we have. Not just because of what we've been taking out, and the destructive means often applied to take fish and other creatures from the sea, but also what we're putting into the sea, either directly or what we put into the atmosphere that falls back into the sea. Interviewer, so, if you were going to give a grade on the health of the oceans today, what would it be? Interviewee, well, it depends on which aspect. Across the board. Huh. The oceans are in trouble. It's hard for me to assign a specific grade. I suppose that it has always been the case, for the majority of us, that the first test of a work of art or literature or music is how much pleasure it gives us, and we don't want to bother with analyzing why or how it has had such an emotional impact on us. It's always good to know what your pleasures are in the positive sense and not as easy as some people think as opposed to only really knowing what you don't like and complaining about it, though presumably there's some kind of pleasure to be had from that too. But now that you've chosen to take a course on the novel, I'm afraid that evaluating literature on the basis of how you feel about a book won't count as an intelligent critical response to the work being studied. It is, however, useful to remind yourselves from time to time that we all fall for trash every now and again. For instance, you might actually enjoy listening to a catchy pop song, but you'd find it hard to explain in critical terms that it is good or better than something else just because it is enjoyable. So, you're here to sharpen up your critical knives, as it were, among other things of course.